yours truly. Thank you so much for coming on to She Leads. I am so excited to have you on the show and just hear from you. So thank you for joining. Thank you for having me and congratulations on launching this really great, uh, you know, medium and ability to have a lot of voices. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Really Thanks. appreciate it. Of course. So, Shuli, you are the co-founding partner of UpWest Labs, a pre-seed and seed stage Silicon Valley fund who invests in Israel's most promising young entrepreneurs and really help them break into the U.S. market. But before before UpWest Labs, you've really been involved in this space and really building this bridge between tech, between U.S. and Israel tech um, for 20, 20 plus years. And you helped found the California Israel Chamber of Commerce, where it's almost this business platform for tech exchanges to happen between Israel and U.S. And you were also named among 100 most influential people in Israeli high tech. So very excited to just talk to you and get to know you better. Um, so what I love to start off is kind of take me back to when you were my age, 22 years old. You went to SF State, San Francisco State University, studying international relations. You also went to Grenoble University in France and studied French studies. Yes. But at this point, what did you imagine your career like? What did you want to be? What questions were you asking yourself? Um. Quick reminder that I also came out of the Israeli military right. uh, during that time. Big, 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 big uh, part, yeah. Which, um, um, which were really, you know, uh, which was really an incredible for me um, opportunity to kind of um, throw me into an environment that was high pressure, um, very intense. At a very young age, and demanded that you know you kind of rise up to the occasion really quickly as a young teen, right? I mean, as a as, as a you know a young adults like you know eighteen year old, and and I think that informed me a lot in both the things that I believed about myself that you know I thought I'm incapable of doing and and all of a sudden you kind of being pushed to your limits on all fronts both you know physically as well as as, as uh, mentally and, um, and and I think that that's what happens to a lot of people um, uh, at that age in Israel who are going into the military service and and I think that really um, um, helped me, you know, come out of a shell, if, if you will, of, um, you know, of a teenage kid. And, um, and that's, um, um, that's also informed me in going forward in, in, you know, always challenging kind of, of you know, the, the, uh, the comfort zone that I'm, that I'm in and knowing that, you know, I can, I can, you know, go through barriers and, you know, come out okay on the other side yeah. and I think that's that's one thing that I think a lot of young people are dealing with right now and and it's just really I'm seeing it in the context of 18 year olds who are graduating from college right now and thinking about what happened what's happening in our world today and there is a lot of you know really uh, um, there's, there's a lot of really, you know, kind of, um, uh, fear and, um, and understanding and, and not experiencing these kinds of, you know, epidemics and lockdowns and curfews and uprising, yeah. um, for many, many of these kids in America, I think that's something that, you know, it's important to understand that generations before have gone through and people have gone through really rough times and came out okay mm -hmm. and actually even stronger from times like this. So, I, so, so what I'm trying to say is that, you know, my young self in early 20s, um, you know, has already gone through two years of military service where, you know, I was, you know, kind of plucked out of my parents' house, which was really comfortable and comforting into, yeah. you know, a system that really kind of, you know, very intense. Um, and, I, and I came out okay and even better. Right. Um, so so that's, that's, I think, is that really important point 
Um, and I think earlier in my career, um, um, I, you know, I, I, as, as you mentioned, I wanted to discover a lot still about who I am, what I'm gravitating to, what really is uh, interesting for me. And as you mentioned, I was in Grenoble for a couple of years in France, then I moved to San Francisco and grew and, and really kind of grew a lot through being part of organizations um, that are working more with international um, you know issues. Um, and, and just to remind you that, um, the early, the late 90s, um, early 2000s were mainly kind of uh, marked by the globalization around the world. Mm. This was the European Union camp coming together. This was, um, um, you know, environmental organizations trying to tackle a lot of issues, anti-disarmament organizations, anti-poverty organizations. And all of that really fascinated me, and I really wanted to be part of, um, you know, making a difference and, you know, making change. And so I was involved in organizations like that in early in my career because I really, really, truly believe that the world is really going to go to, you know, to uh, going to connect mm -hmm. and, um, and, and going to, we're going to bridge all these differences and we're going to prevent all the wars and all the hardships and all the poverty. And I wanted to really be part of that conversation. Mm -hmm. And I, and so I got to really be involved in, in a lot of that um, early on with fabulous people and, learn a lot from a lot of people who were on the political side, people who were on the NGO side. Mm -hmm. And, um, and I learned a lot during that time, um, about the nonprofit world and how, you know, people are, um, advocating for topics, raising money for that, for those things, for causes, uh, mob mobilizing communities to um, to to rally behind uh, a cause or a topic or an issue, creating kind of think tank mm. uh, processes and things like that, and that was really fascinating for me, kind of early on in my career, um, and uh, and and I think that informed me a lot in also how I later on. Um, kind of got into the tech business and yeah. the tech industry um, and uh, um, and started working with entrepreneurs and, and uh, uh, innovators. Yeah. So I think there's so many, so many incredible insights just, just from that answer in the sense, like when you're talking about the IDF and the Israeli army, I think, I think like Startup Nation, the book really highlights how much of an impact it has on kind of creating this startup ecosystem in Israel. And I think it's very important to to note how important and like how it really forces these young Israelis to mature like so quickly. And an even important lesson is the fact that you really grow from these like uncomfortable times and from these challenging times. And, and in the moment, it's hard to see, but kind of when you reflect back, you're just like, wow, I became a whole different person during that experience. So I think it's very important, yeah. especially what we're everything happening today. I think that's definitely a great lesson. Um, yes, and then it is. Yeah. So, so now I'm wondering, as you, as you mentioned, you really became involved in tech. When did you realize that? Or when did you almost observe this bridge that needs to happen between America and Israel? And like, you really saw, okay, this is how we could help the Israeli entrepreneurs even prosper more by breaking into the U.S. market and vice versa. So um, I was very fortunate, you know, to be approached by already a community of, of tech leaders here in Silicon Valley who were looking to mobilize, uh, you know, the kind of the U.S. tech community and the tech giants around here to look for more opportunities in Israel. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, I was already involved somehow um, when they asked me to lead the organization and to kind of build a platform. And... Um, for me, it wasn't so much about, um, you know, the, the innovation and the tech and, and it was more about how do I mobilize a group of people who know nothing about the opportunity in Israel, 
Um, and how do I find these stakeholders and influencers and people with, um, you know, so much uh, ability to impact? How do I bring them together? How do I create for them kind of a common place yeah. to then inform them and being able to, uh, with them, continue and build this platform? And we really started with like 100 people um, who were already kind of on that bridge. But this is, you know, mind you, this is the time pre-Google, pre-Facebook, pre-Twitter. Wow. So yeah. the social networks didn't exist really. Yeah. And so, um, so we kind of had to piece together, um, you know, people had, had to build a network without having these tools that everyone have today um, in order to do that. And I think, you know, LinkedIn was just starting mm -hmm. um, and, uh, and some other kind of business social networks were starting out. Um, it's interesting. I was actually user number 20,000, I think, wow. on LinkedIn. And <laughs> I was an early adopter. <laughs> uh, and I think it was because I was building a network and I really needed a tool. And Reed Hoffman, who started the company, right. kind of was in a circle of people that I've known. And somebody said, hey, you know, join this network. Um, so, and it was the same with Twitter. And it's just really interesting because all these tools today enabling a lot of the founders that I work with to bridge, you know, uh, into the, uh, into their industries and into new markets and all of that. But at the time we really didn't have technology that enabled us to do that. So you had to rely on building personal relationships mm -hmm. one by one and, uh, and creating, um, really kind of a common place uh, and it was a lot in person. I'm always thinking about what if we didn't have all this technology that we're having today, um, you know, and we had a pandemic and that we couldn't be talking like that on Zoom and we couldn't connect businesses yeah. through, uh, you know, all sorts of platforms and communicate with employees and doing all of that. So at the time, you know, I'm, I, I feel ancient when I tell you about it. <laughs> But at the time, really, that all of that was kind of um, very nascent, and it was right after the dot com, um, you know, bust in yeah. San Francisco, and people were actually rising from the ashes wow. of that. And that's another lesson I think that kind of informs me today, as we're seeing, um, you know, we're going into recession, and it'll probably be deep deep recession for a uh, number of years, we're going to see a lot of changes in our society and a lot of changes of how people are doing things. And I think that, you know, experiencing those before, and I remember clearly the year 2000, um, when people really left San Francisco, you know, they were, there was massive exodus from the city. Um, and we've experienced, you know, that deep recession there. A lot of people were unemployed. Uh, but some great companies came out. Yeah. Some really great, um, you know, technologies evolved from that situation. Amazing entrepreneurs with great resilience. So that's, you know, something that I kind of try to hold on to right now, knowing that, it's probably going to be rough yeah. um, and, and we're all going to be affected by it. Definitely. And it's, it's actually interesting how you mentioned. So the idea where you had to meet them in person and really develop these strong personal relationships. I think, I think oftentimes with social media that that aspect kind of gets lost and it's almost like you have to remember how important it is to form those relationships and everything. So I think that's, it's very telling of like the importance of that. Um, so I'm wondering you are obviously like very, you know, the different cultures, like, yeah. so you're very ingrained in the culture with the Israeli culture and the Americans. I'm wondering, did you ever encounter like challenges amongst bridging those two cultures together? Or even today, do you find yourself teaching these young or these Israeli entrepreneurs kind of how to adjust to American culture and also the other way around? Yeah, I mean, I must say that um, younger generation of entrepreneurs out of Israel are so uh, worldly, right? I mean, they've traveled the world after the army. They've, 
you know, they have access to information. They went studying abroad. They've done a lot of things. To, so there's just, just sophistication that is just really amazing. And this is what I really love about, I think, um, investing in Israeli founders is that um, they're really, really, um, uh, I think from day one, are super curious and interested about what's happening in, in different markets, whether it's Asia or U.S. or anywhere. And, uh, and because, you know, so, uh, so many of them are, have traveled the world and, and have experienced, you know, other cultures and embracing other cultures. And so I think we see, we see differences for sure. You know, there's just different way of us communicating. There's this different way of us thinking about short term versus long term. I think Israelis are a much more, um, you know, have been much more short term kind of thinkers because, survival because kind of the environment you kind of you know uh growing into um uh they're also very transactional mm-hmm. in the way they are communicating right they want to get to tachlis. they want to understand you know let's get to the bottom of things mm-hmm. you know they're not the small talk and all of that it just doesn't speak to them so a lot of times I think that is one thing that is really hard to learn mm-hmm. when you move to a new culture and we work or do business in the U.S. and understand that people really need to trust you. People need to really develop a connection to you. And a lot of that is going to happen in different small nuances of communicating and finding shared common ground. Yeah. And for that, that communication has to happen um, and it has to be conversations about, you know, your life's pa- passion. It could be about your travel. It could be about your favorite, you know, basketball team. It could be about the weather or about places you lived in or schools you attended. So all of that we know in American culture creates a lot of times the comfort zone for you to then go and do business. And in Israel, you just don't need that because Everybody knows everyone. We all had common experiences because we all did the military and we all know somebody that knows someone. It's just really super connected. Mm-hmm. So you know, instead of doing all of that small talk, we just get right to business mm-hmm. and we say what we want and we say how we want it and we expect people to just, you know, yeah. tell us as it is. And I think that is where a lot of times things are being lost in translation when Israeli founders and American business people coming together is because there is just a lot of, you know, what Israelis perceive as vagueness on the American side Mm -hmm. and Americans think there is too much directness on the Israeli side. Mm -hmm. Uh, But I must say that, you know, I've seen things, I've I've, I've seen people really evolve really quickly on both sides. Um, you know, in, in, uh, in doing this. And it's fascinating to see that actually. Yes. So it's, that's actually so interesting just to kind of hear the differences in culture and, and kind of the, how experiences really shape you honestly, and how the IDF and everything has really allowed Israelis to have this shared bond that they kind of are able to just get right to it. So I love that. Um, so now tell me about Upwest Labs, what, what inspired you to found this VC fund and really get started and really like make a, make a statement? So, um, you know, I never really thought that this is what I would be doing. Um, although I've touched venture and I've touched investments, um, along the way, Mm -hmm. um, and have, you know, have been kind of on the, um, on the periphery of it so much, uh, in the last 20 years through, um, VCs that have been working with, uh, through founders that I was helping through the U S market. So there was always, I was always in that world, but, uh, definitely starting a fund, um, in 2011 with my co-founder was, uh, was something that, you know, we looked at number one, because we want to make, make a difference. That was kind of a long-term, uh, thinking about, uh, the challenge of Israelis being far away from the market um, is there. And it's been there for a long time and it probably will stay there for a long time. It's just geography and it's just scale, right? I mean, Israel is small. You know, the U.S. is the first market for 90, 90% of the startups. How do you bridge that? How do you, how do you 
you know, uh, build a company that is global and massive and meaningful. And over the years, we just saw, you know, some of the gaps, some of the um, inability of, of companies to uh, accelerate their time to market. And we both really wanted to really uh, <clears throat> take that challenge on and build a platform and something that will enable these founders to really um, you know, help them through this process. Mm -hmm. And, um, and so this obviously started as a fund. So we invested in every entrepreneur that we worked with and, uh, we were the first check, um, and wrote first check to founders who literally had, you know, not much, but a vision and a lot of kind of technical, uh, conviction and knowledge and experience um, and then seeing through their evolution over the years in building massive companies. Um, and it's really incredibly rewarding to see that, um, you know, obviously a lot of companies don't succeed. A lot of companies fail uh, through the process. A lot of companies evolve yeah. very early on. Um, and seeing all of that for the last uh, almost nine years has been, um, you know, uh, a really incredible um, learning process, um, both for me and my founder, as well as, you know, for everybody that's been involved with what we've been doing. Um, and, uh, and so it's, um, it's allowed, it, it's allowed me, you know, starting up West really allowed me to dive deeper, both into technology and, you know, what the world is really, you know, need in terms of technology, but also, uh, dive deeply into the actual process of, you know, how startups are formed and how they're being funded, how they are scaling, yeah. how they are hiring, how they are, you know, um, uh, figuring out their business models and, and, and things like that. And I'm, you know, really excited because, you know, today we have, um, you know, companies that have reached unicorn uh, categories and we were their first you know, believers in those, incredible. in those days. So, incredible. so it's really incredible to see that evolution. Um, but, um, there's so much more to learn so much more to, to kind of understand about this process of yeah. company building and then fund building for us because Upwest is a startup. Yeah. Right. Very true. So, 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 okay. So you mentioned in, the, you mentioned how also as an early stage, fund, there's obviously failure happens. And that's just, it's common for startups to fail. Obviously, there's nine out of 10 startups fail. And I want to know, I love asking my guests, what is your perception of failure? What do you imagine failure as? And almost what do you teach your, what do you kind of advise your entrepreneurs that you invest in when they fail or when they have a, a hiccup in the road? Like, how do you kind of get them through it? It's interesting to, you know, to hear you say, you know, what is a failure? Because I think we all embrace it as something that, um, you know, happens. Um, and I think that, you know, people grow from that. And, 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 and it's, I think you fail if you don't try, right? In my mind, the failure is not trying and not, you know, and giving up before you even start. Yeah. That's failure. So, so, you know, uh, uh, so having, you know, having, you know, given a lot of, uh, I think, our conviction into founders who were just starting out and thinking that, you know, they're going to build something. And obviously, along the way, there are hiccups, there are founders who, um, you know, don't get along, and there are founders who are unable to really find their product market fit. There are many ways why, why companies discontinue. Mm -hmm. um, it's not for the lack of, you know, going at it and trying and building. And so for that, and always having that in mind, uh, when you back founders is that, you know, you, you constantly remain on their side in terms of putting all resources behind for them to be successful. It's ultimately up to them to make it happen. Yeah. Um, but, um, but, but I think, you know, for, for us, it's about providing uh, both a network of very experienced uh, people around, mm -hmm. um, providing, a, I would say, a place for founders to be able to share their challenges with each other, yeah. 
Um, and knowing that, you know, you're accessible for a lot of the kind of things that happen both on their personal as well as their, uh, business side of things. Um, so, so that's, you know, that's from my, from my mind is, you know, the role of investors. I always say to founders, like people who add value and people who don't, um, interrupt with making things happen. Mm -hmm. Right. And so there is, there's a lot of people out there. Uh, we're really great investors and know how to do it. But I think, um, you know, for me, learning, you know, how to, how to really uh, be meaningful and impactful in the journey of the founders as they build their companies um, is, is really interesting. It was an interesting journey for me. Yeah, definitely. I think that's, I think that's great. And I think that's such an important aspect of almost the investor and entrepreneur relationship that you have. Like, I think that's what, what it should be. Um, so talking about, obviously this podcast is she leads. So all about the female leader. And I'd love to just get your perspective and kind of get a taste of your experience being a female, a female inventor. And if you've, you've often experienced being the only female in the room and really navigating around this, um, the, the dynamics that come with it. So I'm wondering just generally your experience as well as any tips that you have for these upcoming females or just any females who maybe are in a male dominated space. Um, it, it started for me in the military because I was, you know, I was an artillery, in artillery school. I was an instructor and mostly men. Yeah. And, um, and then it continued obviously, um, in, in in business and in being in tech and being in Silicon Valley, right. you know, I don't need to tell you, but there was definitely shortage of women in all sorts of you know roles and continues to be. Although we do see improvements, um, I think our tendencies to doubt ourselves, first of all, as women, um, you know, needs to just go away. And I think that is something that I've I've learned about myself, and I and I think. You know, I'm seeing a lot of, of women around me who are so incredibly talented, capable, um, and um, and can really make a difference and can really go out it and and do things that yeah. um, you know are, are are really amazing. But they're holding themselves back, and mm-hmm. I think that is one thing that I um, uh, I think I um, I want to communicate to a lot of a lot of women and leaders and, and people that are starting out their careers and, um, and saying, you know, got what it takes, you know, you definitely do. So, um, I see, I see the difference of how, you know, men and women interact and in business. And I see even, you know, female founders versus male founders. Um, and, um, and, and I think that is something that I, that I, you know, I want to see a lot less self-doubt and a lot more uh, women who just say, you know, yeah, I got it. I can, you know, I can totally go for it. Um, I have to psych myself, you know, about it all the time. Mm-hmm. <laughs> but I think that is part of, um, you know, um, kind of looking at your environment and assess really, you know, you know, your your abilities and, and being true to to, you know, both your passion and what you want to do as well as um, uh, kicking yourself in the ass a little bit and mm-hmm. saying, yeah, you know, that's, yeah. that's totally fine. I agree. I think, I think it's so important. I, um, I've mentioned it before, but I think it starts from us, like having that confidence, having that belief, because that really projects into a room of whoever you're with and knowing that, okay, I belong here. I belong to sit at the head of the table or wherever it may be. And I belong here. So I think that's very true. So to wrap up, actually, before we ask you, before I ask you the two fun questions, I do want to... Oh my God, I don't think I prepared for that. (laughs) (laughs) Okay, well, we'll do it on a whim. But first, I do want you to just mention real quick about the advice for people in their 20s about almost this decade of discovery. Just tell, tell us a little bit about that and then we'll wrap up. Um, so, so it's interesting because I have the analogy of a startup, right? When I think about the early days, you know, of you in your twenties and the early days of a startup is a lot about discovery Mm -hmm. because you do want to find a place where you 
are differentiated, where you can make an impact, where you can be a category leader in, you know, in your industry. Mm-hmm. And a lot of that involves, um, um, you know, kind of doing a lot of conversations and discovery of how you fit in to that, um, to that industry. And I think that, you know, when I think about um, people in their early 20s launching into the world and I say, you know, take the time to really discover who you are means that, um, you know, it's okay to take a gap year. It's okay to travel. It's okay to uh, postpone, the, you know, the, the conventional way of doing things for you to really find the essence of what you want to be and who you want to be and what you want to do, because you're going to be 10 times more successful if you actually discover, you know, who you are. I think that society wants to put us in a box. And I think that is something that we kind of, you know, get into very early on. Um, And I think that's why um, uh, living in different cultures, experiencing different cultures, being in a different pace of environment, yeah. uh, and checking with yourself of how you're doing, and is this something that you gravitate for and you like, you know, helps you later on to understand, you know, how to uh, both find what you want to learn more, or study more, or what environment you want to work in. Yeah. And, and I think it's really important. It's very hard today for, for young people to do all that, yeah. right? I mean, we can't travel. We can't really go out and do different jobs. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, and I think that whoever right now is working on how youth can, can do that during the next few years and during yeah. pandemic years, how youth can experience life and where and what kind of environment <clears throat> because a lot is going to change for them and uh, and we don't want them to just you know sit at home because of that this yeah. is the time to actually go out and and, and discover things so so, um, so so my my yeah my thinking is it. always um, go out and learn from other people talk to a lot of people talk to a lot of people who are a little bit older than you yeah. Um, you know, cause, um, they've, you know, they've, they've learned, uh, from some of the things that they've done exactly. and the paths that they've taken and, yeah. and things like that. I love it. I love it so much. I think that's so great. Okay. So Shuli, I guess you're going to be put on the spot again, even though, <laughs> but anyway, first question is what is, what's a passion or hobby that you have? That's just unrelated to any work at all. <laughs> I would say, um, um, in the last, uh, few months, it's been, um, hiking nice. yeah. and being in nature. And I think that, um, it's always been there and I was backpacking a lot in my twenties oh, yeah. and then, you know, had kids and, you know, started, you know, kind of, uh, you know, living the real life, uh, of, of, you know, um, work and trying to find balance. But I think that I'm finding more and more that this is where I, you know, kind of mm. feel great. So I have a dog. She's amazing. Aww. She's a golden retriever. I love uh, and we spend at least an hour a day um, kind of before sunset doing hikes around the, the trails here. And, um, nice. and, and I found that this is now, you know, my happy place. Yeah, I love that. It's almost like a form of like a meditation type present moment exactly yeah, yeah it's a form it. of meditation mm-hmm. and uh um I think that's great and, and, and that's what i love doing all right so a last question first i love this so thank you for coming on to the show but we have to end with what is a weird or fun talent that you have that really no one knows about so i'm gonna go first okay so we have blueberries here and i'm a blueberry thrower and catcher all right so here we go okay Let's see. Let's see how this goes. There we go. <laughs> oh my god! <laughs> All right. How many times did you practice this? <laughs> I've, been, I've been practicing for years. This is my time to shine. <laughs> A weird talent. I don't think I have one. I'm gonna have to adapt one. I'm gonna have to. You're gonna have to. You know, maybe send right. me some. I'll send you a list. Talent. Well, you can start with blueberries. <laughs> 
Definitely will. I will definitely do that. Okay, well, Shuli, <laughs> I've loved this. So thank you really so much for coming and just sharing your wisdom and insight being a Israeli powerful female in venture capital. And I've, I've loved it. So thank you. Thank you and good luck on your journey. Thank you.